Verse number 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now we covered up through verse 15 this morning. Skip down to verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings, and many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, is, uh, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for an opportunity again to come back to church, Lord, and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, sing about you, and read about you and hear your word preached. Lord, would you please give us the help and instruction that we need? Lord, no doubt there is many needs here and uh, just as many needs as there are souls here and the only one to meet, the only one sufficient to meet all of those is you, Father, and I pray that you would do that. And uh, thank you for giving us such a great salvation. Lord, if you didn't lay down your life willingly, nobody could have taken it from you and we would have no salvation. We thank you for doing that because of your great love for us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Bible says in John 10, verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting correlation here in this passage in John 10 with Psalm 23. So look at, look at this for a, few minute, for a mo moment here. Look at, hold your finger in John 10 and go with me to Psalm 23. When Jesus said he's the good shepherd and he's the shepherd of the sheep, it's just yet one more way to say, I am God. Because Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 80 verse 1, the shepherd of Israel is God. So when he says, I'm the good shepherd, he's, a, he's again claiming to be God. Uh, he can, I mean, how many ways can he do it? <laughs> and, they, and they still don't get it. Who are, you, who are you? What are you talking about? He says it over and over, but... Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as we just saw in Gen, uh, John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Um, in, uh, in Psalm 23, verse number 2, it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
green pastures. Uh, John 10, uh, John 10, look at verse number 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You know what green pasture is? Green pasture is a uh, pasture that hasn't been uh, eaten up yet, a uh, uh, pasture that hasn't been devoured yet. You know, this Bible is such an amazing book. It's alive, it's living. Every time you go to it, you can find green pasture. You can find new uh, food for your soul and to strengthen you. It, it may be a, a passage you've read a hundred times. It might even be a passage you have memorized, and you can go to it and find green pastures. New food to, uh, to strengthen your soul. Praise the Lord. And the Lord says he, he leads into green pastures. And Psalm 23, verse number 2, it says, He leadeth me beside the still waters. The still waters. Uh, look at John chapter 10, verse number 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now, as we saw this morning, he leads them out of their national religion and into a relationship with him where they can have peace with God. You know what, the, you know what still waters is? It's peace. Peace. Isaiah 57 says the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. And Jesus Christ can give, give rest for your souls. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, your body might be in trouble. Your body might be in, in, in a lot of pain and anguish, but you can have rest for your soul. In Psalm 22, uh, Psalm 23, look at verse number 3. He restoreth my soul. Praise the Lord. John 10, 9. Uh, if any man uh, enter by this door, he'll, he'll be saved. When, the Lord, when you trust the Lord, he saved your soul. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Look at John 10. Verse number 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So you ought to be saved, but then once you're saved, you ought to follow the Lord in and out. And uh, Psalm 23 says, uh, verse 3, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. For His name's sake. You know, the Lord wants us to be righteous, but it's, it, when it gets right down to it, it's, it's for His name's sake. Because it's Him we represent in this world. And uh, our testimony, should, it, it should mean something to us personally, but it means something to the Lord if our name is attached to His name. And as we go out into this world, if we claim to represent Him, the Lord wants us in paths of righteousness because it's for His name's sake. We represent Him in His name. And when we claim the name of Christ and we don't depart from iniquity, we're not just tarnishing our own name, we're, we're tarnishing the name of Christ. And so the Lord wants us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And then Psalm 23, look at verse number 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. And uh, in John 10, verse number 10, it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There is always someone trying to take you away from the Lord and your relationship to the Lord. They're trying to take advantage of you, steal and kill. And, but right in the middle of it, you can have uh, satisfaction. Right in the middle of it, you can be fed by the Lord. And that's what Psalm 23, 4 says. Surrounded by enemies, surrounded by the shadow of death, and yet the Lord's with us. And His rod and His staff comforts us. Uh, Psalm 23, verse number 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I, and you talk about you know, having a full cup. How about the cup running over? So much joy that you can't keep it inside. So much happiness, it has to come out. It runs over. And John chapter 10 Verse number 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly, just overflowing. That's what the Lord wants to do for you. That's what the Lord can do for you. He wants, he wants it to overflow. And Psalm 23, verse number 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. If you'll follow the Lord, goodness and mercy will follow you. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. It's a blessing when we can come into church. It'll be an even greater blessing one day when we'll never have to leave. We'll always be in fellowship with the, with the Lord and with each other. And John chapter 10, verse number 16 and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Perfect unity forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Well, there's, um, there's, a, there's a few shepherds in the Old Testament that picture Jesus Christ, uh, and I, I want to uh, just do a quick Bible study on them. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 4. Just look quickly at five shepherds in the Old Testament that, that picture Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. And you know, the picture is never as good as the real thing. And we're going ha- to look at five pictures of Jesus Christ and combined they still don't match the, the real thing. We got to get five pictures to represent one real good shepherd. And even so, they don't hit the mark. But uh, Genesis chapter f- uh, 4 Genesis 4, you know Cain, Cain and Abel, what happened there. Just jump in to verse, verse 3. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of, of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel also, he also brought of the firstlings of, the, of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So here's the first shepherd in the Bible. And this shepherd was killed by his own flesh and blood. And what a great picture of Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And we know the Romans carried out the execution, but you read the uh, early part of the book of Acts, and who charged? Who was charged with the murder and the killing of Jesus Christ? It was the Jews. It was the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ put to death by his own flesh and blood. And it's a great picture there. Look at the next one here. Look at uh, Genesis 33. So Abel pictures the shepherd who is killed by his own flesh and blood. Genesis 33. Jacob and Esau here are having a conversation. Pick it up in verse 12. Genesis 33, 12. And he said... Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children uh, be able to endure until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. Now, Jacob's the next shepherd here that pictures Jesus Christ, and he is noted for his particular care of the flock. I don't want to drive them. I don't want to even lead them too hard. I'm going to lead them softly because I don't want them to die. And, uh, you know, men, men may have standards for you that in all reality are just unrealistic. It's not that it's, It's not that you're not doing your best, it's just they expect you to be here and it's just not happening. But the Lord knows exactly what you can handle. And He never drives you to, He will push you and He will drive you and He will continue to try to get up to uh, to the standard He wants you to get to. But He he cares for you and He loves you and He's going to make sure that you grow the right way and your roots grow down and then you go up. He's not going to drive you too far. You, You know, when you follow the Lord, you never have to wonder, Lord, are you taking me too far? Is, I see what you want me to do. Is this, is this going to be too much for me? Can I handle it? The Lord knows exactly what you can handle. And if he's leading you, it's because he knows you can handle that. So you can feel safe in following the Lord. And Jacob was noted for his particular care of the flock. 
Uh, look at the next one. Look at Genesis 37. Genesis 37, verse number 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billa and, and with those sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Now, here's the next shepherd. Here is Joseph. And what does, it say, what does it say about him? He fed the flock, and he was his father's favorite son. Now, Jesus Christ, if you're saved, you're a child of God, but he's got, only, he's got one begotten son. He's got one son that he looked down and said, this is the one I'm well pleased in, and that's Jesus Christ. And what a great picture we have here in Joseph, who fed the flock, and he was his father's favorite. Uh, look at the next one here. Look at Exodus chapter 2. Now, here's the great thing about Jesus Christ. You have to get all these examples to get a decent picture of Jesus, because not one of them does it all. <laughs> I mean, you want a picture of, of a shepherd dying for other people? Okay, we'll get Abel. You want a picture of someone who cares about the flock? Okay, we'll get Jacob. You want a picture of someone who's, who's his father's favorite? Okay, we'll get Joseph. Another, you got to find all these different people to just to find a, a, a good picture of who Jesus is, and even all of them put together, they don't measure up to Jesus Christ. Look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus 2, look at verse number 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the trowels to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Verse 19, and they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Look at chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So we see Moses keeping the flock, watering the flock, and protecting the flock. What a great shepherd uh, we have in Jesus Christ to do that for us today. Praise the Lord. And then the, and then the last one we'll look at, uh, 1 Samuel 17. First Samuel 17, we got David here. First Samuel 17, verse number 34. He's going out to fight Goliath, and, and David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath delivered excuse me, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So what did David do? He risked everything to protect the sheep. He risked it all. He risked his own life to protect the sheep. So here's, great, here's five shepherds in the Old Testament that picture Jesus Christ. But Jesus, the only one that could say, I'm the good shepherd. Praise the Lord. Now, get, uh, get three places with me. Get John 10. 1 Peter chapter 5 and Hebrews 13. John 10, 1 Peter chapter 5 and Hebrews 13. I mentioned this briefly this morning, but the New Testament, Jesus is called, there's three descriptions of him as, as being, uh, as what kind of shepherd he is in the New Testament. John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, <clears throat> verse number 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect 
Now, in John 10, he's the good shepherd, and what's connected with that? His giving his life, right? Giving his life for the sheep. In Hebrews 13, he's that great shepherd of the, che- of the sheep, and what's he connected with, with here? Helping you through your life, right? Perfecting you, verse 21. What, is, what does he do? Verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, he's, he's a great shepherd of the sheep because he's not going to let you wander around to your own destruction. He will give you grace and he will be long-suffering, but he wants what's best for you. And what's best for you is to follow the Lord. And he's not going to let you want, if you belong to him, he's not going to let you wander and wander away and never come looking for you, praise the Lord. He wants to make you perfect, uh, complete in your walk with the Lord. And then look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear... Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, in connection to him being the chief shepherd here, what's what's it in connection with? His 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 return, his appearing. So you have it, you have the good shepherd, that's connected with his giving his life on the cross. He's the great shepherd, that has to do with helping you in this life right now. And then he's the chief shepherd having to do with his return. Good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd. And there's, uh, it's an interesting correlation to this in Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Uh, go back with me to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. There, look, there's some chapters you really just ought to know. You ought to know Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. It's about the crucifixion. You ought to know that. Um, there's some chapters uh, that just ought to stand out in your mind. I know what that's about. You know, Psalm 22, Isaiah 50. There's, more, there's plenty more passages in, in the Old Testament uh, about um, the crucifixion, but these are the, these are the big ones. Uh, Psalm 22, verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, he's not... He's not, talk, he's not using the Lord's name in vain here. He's talking to God. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him. You know what that is? this is? It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. What did they say to Jesus was on, when He was on the cross? He saved others, Himself He cannot save. Let Him call now, see if uh, Elias will come deliver Him. God will deliver Him, right? So, Psalm 22, what do you have? You have the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then Psalm 23, we won't read it again. We, we covered it at the beginning here, but what is that? That's the Lord's helping you through this life. He's, he's leading you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's got a table in the presence of His enemies. It, it's, he's helping you through this life. And then Psalm 24, verse number 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. This world hasn't seen him yet, but they will. They'll see him. Verse number 9, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. So what do you have in Psalm 22, 23, and 24? You have the crucifixion. 
you have the Lord really doctrinally pointing forward to the time of tribulation, but the Lord's helping you in this life. And then Psalm 24, you have the second coming. And Jesus is the good shepherd. He gives his life for the sheep. He is that great shepherd. He makes you perfect in this life. And he is the chief shepherd. He's coming back one day. So he takes care of you from start to finish. It never ends. Praise the Lord. Now go back with me to John 10. John chapter 10. Verse number 16. John 10, 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, don't you like that? You know what that is? Who's the, uh, we, we saw this morning the sheep is the house of Israel. Who's this other sheep? It's the Gentiles, and we get in on that, praise the Lord, and it's no more Jews over here and Gentiles over here. Now it's one fold and one shepherd, praise the Lord. Now, if these Jews knew what he meant when he said that, they would have tried to stone him again right there, but it just went completely over their head. But that, those Jews hated those Gentiles, uh, but he said there should be one fold and one shepherd. Look at, look at me at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, look at verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So there was a, there was a wall of partition. Here's my special sheep over here, here's the rest of you over here, and that middle wall was broken down when Jesus Christ shed his blood. Look at chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So praise the Lord. Whether you're a saved Christian in America or a saved Christian in Sierra Leone, you can say, Jesus Christ is my Savior and He's my shepherd. Praise the Lord. And the Lord made one fold and here, there's one shepherd over all, all, over all of them. Now go back with me to John 10. John 10. You know, it's better to be in the, it's, I think, much better to be on this side of Calvary than the other side. Uh, Hebrews actually makes that pretty clear, more than my opinion, makes it pretty clear, some better thing for us. Even more is it better for if you're a Gentile after the flesh. At least if you were a Jew, you could say, we have God's law, we have, we have the promises, we have the fathers. If you were a Gentile, you, you got nothing. <laughs> You got creation there, there, there. You see the creation, right? You see my eternal power and Godhead, right? All right, well, then you got enough. <laughs> so praise the Lord. We're on uh, this side of Calvary. But John 10, verse number 17, the Bible says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, in verse 16, he says there's going to be one fold and one shepherd, and he immediately follows that up by saying, I'm going to lay down my life and take it again. How does he make one fold? He does it by laying down his life and shedding his blood. So he said there's going to be one fold and one shepherd, and then he says, and how am I going to do that? I'm going to lay down my life and take it again. And that's, what, that's where we get in. And uh, he says in verse number uh, 17, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He says, no man taketh it from me. Haven't we seen that in the book of John? How many times they tried to kill him, they can't do it. He's not going to die until he decides it's time to die. 
He says, uh, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. Now, you wouldn't think it takes power to lay it down. We understand it takes power to take it up again, but it takes power to lay it down. Because you can't just stand here this morning or sit where you're sitting here this morning and say, you know what, I'm done now. Uh, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You can't do that. Now, some people will do some things to try to end their life, and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. But you can't just say, I'm done, I dismiss my spirit. You don't have that power. But Jesus did when he, when he hung on that cross. He said, they, nobody killed him. He says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he said that with a loud voice, which means he wasn't overcome. Uh, he, he laid it life down. And then he said, I have power to take it again. Now, get two places with me. Get Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and Luke 23. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and Luke 23. If I was going to choose someone to follow, I would want to pick someone that death had no power over. Yes, sir. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and Luke chapter 23. Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. <clears throat> there is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. No man, no man has the power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Now look at verse, uh, excuse me, Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Well, Jesus was a man, but he wasn't just a man. He is God manifest in the flesh. And he did what no other man could do. He had power to lay it down. He had power to take it again. You know, in the time of that tribulation, you ever read that in Revelation 9? Those creatures coming out of the pit, those are pretty wild things, right? Those are pretty wild things. Hair like women, they, it, women. They got tails like scorpions. It's, a, it's a, you say, what do you think that means? I think it means exactly what it says. I don't think it means it's a helicopter or any other kind of, kind of wild explanation. I think it means exactly what it says. But in that, in, it, it's going to be so bad. The Bible says in Revelation 9, 6, men will desire to die. They'll seek death and they won't find it. They'll try to end their life and they won't be able to. That, that's, that's pretty bad. And I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Trying to, it's so bad, you try to end your life to escape it. You know, and, and then when they finally do, it's, it's not any better. That's the sad part. That's the sad part. Just, in fact, it just gets worse. That's why that ought to give you plenty of motivation to tell people about Jesus Christ and witness for Him. But uh, John, go back with me to John 10. John 10, end of verse 18, Jesus said, This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, what a commandment. <laughs> what a commandment to obey. I want you to go to that cross. I want you to die and shed your blood for the sins of the whole world. Now, whatever commandment that you find unreasonable that God would demand of you, it's not, as, it's not, as, uh, quite, it's not a commandment like this. <laughs> Whatever commandment that, you, that God has given to you that you think is over the line, over the top, God, why do I have to do this? He has never given you a commandment like this one, right? Now, Jesus obeyed this commandment, right? Philippians 2 eight. he was obedient unto death, right? He obeyed this commandment. Again, Jesus leads, he goeth before the sheep. Has he given you commandments? Yes, he has. Has he given me commandments? Yes, he has. And he kept the greatest one before he ever gave us any. Praise the Lord. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now look at verse number 19. Actually, before we go there, I'm going to do a quick, quick little Bible study here. Jesus said he, he laid down his life and he took it back up again. Now, all three members of the Godhead, the Father, Word, Holy Ghost, they all had a part in the resurrection. And they all had a part in Jesus' incarnation. 
and they all had a part um, in his in, in the atonement. I want to show you that. Uh, look at, um, so Jesus laid his life down. He took it back up again. Uh, with that, get uh, Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 1. Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 1. Romans 8, 11. A lot of scripture tonight, but good thing. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So the spirit raised Jesus from the dead, right? And now look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I knew that wasn't right. Look at, look at verse 1 is what I want. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So, the Father raised Jesus from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus raised himself from the dead. There you have the Trinity, three in one. Uh, and then they all, all three had a part in his, in his, his incarnation, his coming, his coming to the, into the world. Look at, get three places. Get Hebrews 10, Hebrews chapter 10, Philippians chapter 2, and Luke chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 10, Philippians chapter 2, and Luke chapter 1. Hebrews 10, look at verse number 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore he cometh into the world, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. What is that? That's Jesus talking to his Father. A body hast thou prepared me. So who prepared the body for Jesus Christ? It was his Father. Now, Philippians chapter 2. Verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. So he had part in forming his own body. And then uh, look, at, look at Luke chapter one. Verse number 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So, the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and there's a body. So, all three members, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all have a part in His incarnation. And then they all have a part in the atonement. Get Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Ephesians chapter 5. Isaiah 53, Ephesians chapter 5, and Hebrews chapter 9. Isaiah 53, Ephesians 5, and Hebrews 9. Isaiah 53, verse number 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Look at verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
So who, who bruised the Son of God? Who um, <clears throat> laid the iniquity of us on Him? It was the Father. Right? Now look at Ephesians chapter 5. Verse number 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So Jesus Christ offered himself. The Father laid the iniquity on him, but Jesus offered himself. And then look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So how did he offer himself? It was through the eternal spirit. So they all had part of his incarnation. They all had part of his resurrection and his atonement. There's, that's a great trinity, isn't it? Three in one. Now go back with me to John chapter 10. Now, you say, can you explain that? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But I believe it, no doubt in my mind. <clears throat> John chapter 10, verse number 19. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings. And there always is a division when you, when you speak the words of Jesus Christ. There always is, and there always, there, there, always, there always should be. That's the way it's supposed to be. If there's no division, you're not speaking the Word of God. <laughs> you don't have to go out and purposely cause controversy, but if you speak the words of Jesus Christ, there will be a division among the people. And there was here, verse number 20, And many of them said, He hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Now, in the last, four, in the last few chapters, going back to chapter 7, this is the fourth time he's been called a devil. I got a lot of things to answer for. I don't want to have to answer for that one. Call Jesus Christ the devil. But he said in verse uh, uh, 21, Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Now, who, who's, the only, who's the only one that opens the eyes of the blind? Go back with me to Psalm 146. That's a reference to the previous chapter in John chapter 9 when Jesus heals the blind man, but look at Psalm 146. Psalm 146, verse number 8. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. So it's God that opens the eyes of the blind. So when Jesus healed that blind man in John chapter 9, what is it? It's another proof that he's God manifest in the flesh. And so, but there, there's a division among them. Now look at verse number 22, John 10, 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. Now, whether this was the, the dedication like uh, of Nehemiah's of day that you read about in Ezra 6, or whether this was... The one from secular history, it, that was after it was destroyed by Antioch, it's Epiphanes, and they rededicated it. Um, it both of those feasts are in the winter, so I'm not going to say for sure which one it was, but that it's the Feast of the Dedication. Verse 23 says, Jesus walked in the temple and Solomon's porch. Now, winter is a type of old age, it's a type of death, it's the end of the year, end of the season, things are dying right before the spring comes. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4 Paul's at the end of his life, and he tells, he tells Timothy, come before winter. you got to get here. If you, if you don't get here before winter's over, it's going to be too late. And uh, he's talking about the literal season of winter, but what a great type. What a great type of the end of his life. And here's the feast of the dedication. And it, it was winter. And what a great picture. You know what this is? This is the winter season of the Jewish religion. It's about to come to a close. That's what Jesus has been talking to them about this whole book. Your, I'm, 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 I'm ending your temple, your feast days, and now it's about me. And now it's, it's the feast of the dedication, and it's winter. Verse 24 then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. 
Now, if you've been with, with us through this whole study of John, he couldn't have made it any more plain. He could not have said it any more plain. He said it over and over and over again, I am God. In John chapter 5, he lays out five witnesses, spells it out in detail. The scriptures testify of him. His works testify of him. John the Baptist testified of him. Five witnesses that he laid out that he said, I am God. But they don't get it. They, won't, they don't get it because they won't receive it. He says, if, if they said, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, someone who's obeying the word of the Lord, someone who's receiving the instruction that God has to give them, the word of God's plain to them. It's not hard to understand. The problem is, the problem's not what, it's been said before by, by many preachers, I'm sure. The, pro, the problem in the Bible is not the parts we don't understand, it's the parts that we do understand. That's the, pro that's the parts that give us the most trouble because it's not about our ability to receive it or to, un to understand it intellectually. It's about our willingness to put it into practice. And they have showed time and time again that they don't believe and they won't receive the words of God and the words of Jesus Christ, and it's not plain to them. Now go back with me, go back with me to Proverbs chapter 8. It's a very, very dangerous position to, to be in to reject the clear teaching and instruction of the Word of God. Because once you reject light, that light may not come back your way again. Because the Lord's going to say, I gave you light and you didn't want it. Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 8. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain. To him that understandeth, and write to them that find knowledge. You know what Proverbs says? If God's words, if they are not plain, it's not the Lord's fault. It's your fault because you won't understand. You won't depart from evil. You won't receive the truth. They're plain to those that understand. And so the fact that they tell Jesus, why don't you tell us plainly? That says more about them than it does about him. And that shows the problem with their heart. Uh, go back with me to John chapter 10. He gave a, uh, this, this, this uh, account of the, of the uh, shepherd and the sheep is called a parable in verse number 6. And we won't turn there, but if you read Matthew chapter 13, there's a very specific reason why the Lord began to use parables. It's not that he couldn't just say what he wanted to say without using an illustration. He used parables for the very fact that they rejected his plain teaching. And he says, now I'm going to use parables so that they don't understand and they don't see, but the ones that want to know can come ask me later and I'll explain it to them. So the fact that he's using parables is evidence of their rejection. That's why he used it, according to Matthew chapter 13. It, it, we won't turn there. Matthew chapter 13 is the first time he uses the parable in the book of Matthew. And that's, that's right after 12 chapters where they've rejected him. And now, he, now he's beginning to turn away from them. And now he starts speaking in parables. But they're not plain. Now verse 25, John 10, 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Jesus said, I told you, you didn't believe. Now, isn't that, isn't that similar to what the blind man said in John 9? Look at John 9, look at verse 27. Uh, look at starting verse 26. They, then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How, how opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? <laughs> Will ye also be his disciples? <laughs> And so Jesus pretty much gave them, the, gave them the same answer. I already told you and you didn't believe. I already told you and you didn't believe. And um, like we've mentioned before, you know, the Lord, once he's given you an answer, he's never going to change his mind. Once he's given you an answer from the, from the scripture, you can ask him a thousand times. You can ask him till you're blue in the face. He is never going to change his mind once he's already said something. And so they keep asking him. But he says, look, I already told you. I already told you. Verse 26, John 10, 26, he says, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Now that's huge. That's huge, because you know what's beginning to happen? He's beginning to shift. 
It, the, the sheep isn't just the house of it. He's telling Jews, you're not of my sheep. That's huge. Because in the Old Testament, the sheep was the nation of Israel. And he's looking at Jews, telling them, you're not of my sheep. You don't belong to me. So he's beginning to shift. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Who do you follow? Whose voice do you listen to? The Lord's sheep listen to him. They follow him. Verse 28. And I, and I give unto them eternal life. Praise the Lord. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, this is very significant because Jesus, the Good Shepherd, what has He just done? What is He just telling them? This whole book, what is He doing? He's leading them out of Judaism, out of the religion that God gave them, and into a relationship with Himself. Right? It, it takes, you can understand, it takes maybe a little getting used to the idea, look, the Lord really did give them their law and their temple in the feast days, and now Jesus Christ is leading them out of that, and He says, look, it's really just about me now. You can understand their hesitancy, and now, now He says, look, once you come into a relationship with me, it's never going to end. Because can't you see the hesitancy? Well, if the Lord gave us Judaism, and eventually He took us out of that. Now you're coming along, or eventually, we, or eventually we're going to leave you too. Right? That would be the natural thinking. Look, God gave us Judaism. You're saying now to, to leave it and trust you. Well, are we ever going to be leaving you? Is, that, is the Lord ever going to lead us out of your hand? No, this relationship is forever. This one doesn't end. This one is forever. It never ends, praise the Lord. And there may, there may be things in your past, may, maybe some experiences in your past, maybe some relationships in your past that have caused you to doubt the permanency of relationships and caused you to doubt the permanency of, of, of real relationships. And you can be sure that once you get into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's never going to end. No man's ever going to pluck you out of His hand. And uh, we won't turn there, but um, if you want to write down Isaiah 40... Verse number 12, the Lord said he meted out heaven with the span. So the Lord's hand covers the entire universe. So you're not getting out of that hand. Praise the Lord for that. And then he says in verse 30, I and my Father are one. Could it get any more plainer? Could it get any more? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, I already told you, but let me just say it one more time. I and my Father are one. You know, a lot of people say they want something, they want the truth plain, and then when they get it, they really don't want it plain. <laughs> Tell us plainly. Okay, I and my Father are one. Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone them. <laughs> so what do you want? You want it plain or don't you? <laughs> you know, a lot of Christians, they complain, rightly so, but they complain about the false preachers and the phony teachers and the slick teachers and the liars and the deceivers and the thieves, rightly so. But then they say, we want somebody to tell us the truth. And then many of those same people, when they actually do hear someone giving them the truth, they don't want it and they reject it. <laughs> well, you, which, one, which one do you want? Make up your mind. You want someone to open the Bible and give you the truth plain or don't you? Well, I, well, I want it plain about Jehovah Witnesses, and I want it plain against Mormons and cults and those people, but I don't really want it all that plain when it comes to my sins. <laughs> right? They said, tell us plain. Okay, I and my father are one. Yeah, let's stone them. Now, doesn't that say something about the heart of man? That, look, what has he just said? I'll give you eternal life. You'll never perish. You'll, have, you'll live with me forever. And the reaction is to stone the man for saying that. It shows you the heart of man. But uh, look at verse number 30. You, you, think, you think they'd give up on it, though. How many times have they tried to stone him and it never works? You think they'd just give up. Well, we think he deserves stoning, but we can, we can never do it. You think they'd just give up, <laughs> but they don't. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and, and because that thou, being a man, 
makest thyself God. Actually, it was the, up, actually it was the opposite. He was God who made himself man. <laughs> it was completely the opposite. He's not a man who made himself God. He's God who made himself man. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? That's Psalm 82.6, if you're taking notes, Psalm 82.6. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Now just stop right there. The scripture cannot be broken. Praise the Lord for that. We sing the song, Standing on the Promises. You know why you can stand on the promises? Because they can't be broken. You can stand on them, you can jump on them, you can run on them, you can do laps on them. The scripture cannot be broken. So you can trust the promises of God. Everything God said will come to pass, has come to pass, or is coming to pass. The scripture cannot be broken. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 36, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now I've read this passage over and over and over again. I don't know if I can get in the full, the full thrust of what he's saying, but what he is saying is I haven't broken any scripture in saying this. Everything I've done is in accord with the scripture. The scripture cannot be broken. Everything I'm doing is in accord with the scriptures. But he says, verse 37, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. Now that's, that's, that's an amazing statement, I think. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says, If my works don't match my words, don't believe me. Now, what a challenge to us. If our works don't match our words, why, we have no right to expect the world to believe what we're saying. If we go out and tell them Jesus Christ can save your soul, He can give you life, He can give you life more abundant, and nothing about your life matches what you're offering, you have no right to expect anyone to believe you. Jesus Christ said, look, if my works don't match my words, don't believe me. Now, He could say that, and every single one of His works matched His words every single time. But that all, that's the goal for us. We should be a witness, and we should be a bold witness, but if our testimony doesn't back that up, we have no right to expect the world to believe us. If Jesus Christ said that, how much more true is it of us? But he says in verse 36, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world. Now, to sanctify means to set apart for God's service. It's it's closely tied to holiness, but it, it's, it's not the same. Because Jesus Christ never had to be made holy. He was always holy. But He was sanctified. He was set apart for a specific purpose. And that's the mission that His Father sent Him, sent him on to come into the world. Now, John is the only gospel where it says the Father sanctified the Son. It's also the only gospel that calls Jesus Christ the Lamb of God. Now, if you go back and we won't turn there, if, we, if you go back and read Exodus chapter 12, it's the Passover. There's a lamb slain on the 14th day of the month, but they took him out from the flock on the 10th day of the month. They separated him from the rest of the flock on the 10th day of the month, and he was kept till the 14th day of the month when he was actually offered. So that what was that lamb? He was sanctified. He was set apart from the flock for several days until he was offered. And the Bible says that the Father sanctified the Son. John's the only gospel that said he was sanctified, and John's the only gospel that said he's the Lamb of God. And he's sanctified and sent into the world. Now, if Jesus Christ was sanctified before he went on his mission, and he was always holy and never sinned, how much more should we be sanctified to do the, Lord, the, the work that the Lord's called us to do? We're supposed to be separated unto God. Separated from the world, yes, and unto the Lord. Sanctified to do the work of the Lord's called us to do. Now verse 38. But if I, if I do, that's the works, if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Another plain statement on the deity of Christ. 
Verse 39, therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. Again, you think they just give up on it. He's not going to die till he's ready to die, till he's ready to lay his life down. Verse 40, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Now, a couple things I want to bring to light before we close tonight, but they said John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Now, you know what that means? That means there was a lot of people that heard John the Baptist preach that didn't believe till after John was dead. In other words, John never saw the full fruits of his ministry while he was alive. There was many people that he preached to that after he was dead and gone, they believed on Jesus Christ because they remembered what he said. Everything John said about this man was true. That ought to be a source of encouragement to you and I today that, look, you witness and you witness and you witness and I don't know about you, but I don't see near the amount of results that I would like to see, but you're never going to see all the results in your lifetime. And, and many, many people might believe that you have no idea about or believe after you're gone and, and to be with the Lord. So you ought to keep plowing and keep pushing because you have no idea. You have no idea the effect that your works and your preaching and your witnessing will have till you get home and we have that great big reunion in the air. But verse number 42 says, And many believed on him there. Now, as we won't run the references tonight, but over and over again, we've seen opposition, opposition, and many believed. Right, chapter 2, they're opposing him. He drives them all out of the temple. And then a few verses later, many believed. John chapter 7, they're calling him a devil. No man speaking openly of him. By the end of that chapter, many believe. In here, they called him a devil. They're opposing him. They're trying to stone him. They're, trying to, they're accusing him of blasphemy. And how does the chapter end? Many believed on him. Now, if you quit while the persecution is still going and you don't stick it out to the end, you're never going to see these great results and, this, and, and the great things that are going to happen. You've got to keep going despite the hardships and the persecution because you've got to stick, stick it out to the end because you haven't seen the end of it. You have not seen the end of it yet. So keep going, keep pressing. There is, there, there, it's worth it. It's worth it. It may not seem it now. You might be frustrated. You might say, what good is this? A lot of good. It does a lot of good. And this chapter, despite everything that's gone on, the rejection, the attempted stonings, the accusation, how does it end? Many believed. Many believed on him. So keep going. Keep plowing. Don't give up. The Lord will make it worth your while for having served him.